Hey, it's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and buttonbrostudios.com and in this tutorial we are going to be learning about how to draw heads. But not just your regular run-of-the-mill head, we are going to be discussing head shape, feature and hairstyle variation. Now this lesson is actually part of a much larger class which you can access via the links in the description below. It is available on both howtodrawcomics.net and Skillshare. So if you want to delve deeper into this topic, then I highly recommend checking out the full class. But for now, let's watch the tutorial and get straight into it. Okay, so I'm going to do up three different examples here, and each one of these examples, I'm going to turn them into individual, unique looking heads. So they're going to look different from one another. In many different ways. So the first head that I'm going to do is a male head. And I'm just going to first up loosely sketch out a sphere onto the canvas. I'm keeping it rough and I'm keeping it light. So light you may find it a little bit hard to see actually. Then I'm going to lay in the axes. All of these heads will be drawn at an eye level, uh, just so that we can take a look at how much their proportions are being affected without the distortions applied to them we, that we might see if we were to put it into more of a dynamic perspective. Okay, so I've got my vertical axes established. I've got my horizontal equator axes established. Next up, I'm going to lay in the side planes. And here you'll notice I'm not even going to draw in another vertical axis. Instead, I'm just going to chop away this side plane straight away. All right? So we've drawn that in very lightly. And by the way, when I'm drawing in these side planes, I'm looking at how much space I've got on either side of the sphere. We've got this middle line here, and I know that I've got at least this much space on the far side of the face. And so when I'm drawing in my side plane and I want to know how wide to make it, well I just look at trying to capture an equal amount of space, with foreshortening taken into account since it's a three-quarter angle, I try to capture a similar amount of space on the opposite side. Okay, so that'll give me a symmetrical, even-looking face. So in a way, the center line actually determines how large the side planes will be. Once I've got the side plane laid in, I'm going to draw another vertical guideline straight down the middle of it, and then draw out the face. Now, for this face, uh, what I'm going to do is a much longer face than I would otherwise normally draw. So I'm going to take this center line all the way down here. So this will be a very exaggerated looking face because it's stretched. And different sorts of head shapes are going to, of course, provoke certain feelings and interpretations within your viewer. Okay? They're going to feel different ways about these various character representations that you've come up with. Now what kind of jawline are we going to give this character? Well that's another good question because you can mess around with the shape of the jawline a little bit. You could make it a squarer jaw, you could make it more of a triangular jaw, and I think that given this character has a longer head in general, a triangular jaw might actually work quite well. But we can also choose to make it more interesting by dropping the corners of the jaw down even further. So I'm going to go ahead and do that as well. So you can see that you know, the corners of the jaw are all the way down here, whereas normally I would have stopped them at you know, just underneath the sphere. We can mess around with the shape of the jaw itself. So in other words, I can play around with this edge that connects the corners of the jaw to the chin. I could even give him a little bit of a an upward raise right in the middle of the chin there. 
again, there's all of these different unique characteristics that you can play around with. And then we can drop the jaw down on the other side. Now I want to try to keep all these changes symmetrical. So I'm going to drop the corners of the jaw on this side of the face down to the same, the same length, same distance, and make sure that they align. So there's lots of different sorts of jaws that you can have. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just do some examples up here really quickly. You know, you could have a square looking jaw like this. Second. You could have a square looking jaw like this, you know, where we've changed, basically you're changing up the angles of the jawline and also the placement of the corners of the jaw as well. Again, the jaw more triangular if you want. You can make it rounded. Okay, you could come up and invent your own jaw lines if you want to. Totally fine. Anything really goes when it comes to character design. What matters is that they look like their bio. In other words, you know, characters tend to visually represent who they are supposed to be on the inside. And so if you're drawing a villain, for example, well, a longer, gaunter looking face is going to work really well, you know, a pointed looking nose, a, a scary grin, evil looking eyes. All of that stuff plays into what a villain should look like. And if you give a hero, like a good guy, those characteristics, people will mistake him for a villain. Because we all have these visual associations that we create with the characters that we observe. Okay, great. By the way, you don't necessarily have to do exactly what I'm doing here on the screen. I'd encourage you to experiment a little bit, you know, see what kind of shapes that you can come up with for your head. All right, so once we have got the jawline placed in, we can decide where we're going to place this character's nose. Is he going to have a short nose? Is he going to have a longer nose? Well, I think that in this instance, I might give the character a longer nose. So I'm going to place a little dash for it lower down toward the chin. As for the mouth, I'm going to place that close to the nose, just underneath it. So he's got a really big nose and a pretty big chin and a giant jaw. And next up, we'll give him some eyes. And I'm going to place the eyes all the way up here. Right, and you can see that you can always see the character coming through here, even on the basic level of the foundational head that we've drawn. The ears, what we'll do is give him some little ears. I think that'll work quite well. And then as for his hairline, and we will be talking about hair here, what we can go ahead and do is mess around with the shape of it. So let's see, let's see what we can come up with here. Maybe a widow's peak hairline. I think that'll work pretty well. That's kind of receding. It's dropping down right there in the middle. That'll work A-OK. -okay. Next up, we've got a neck. So we'll drop the neck down to about there. He doesn't have a super thick neck. He doesn't have a super thin one either. Somewhere in the middle. OK, wonderful. So we've got our head drawn out, at least the foundations of it. Next, what I'll do is start drawing in the eyes. So just as with the general shape of the face, we can also go ahead and start tweaking the shape that we want to go for with the eyes. So is he going to have little eyes or big eyes? Well, I think what I'll give him is long eyes. Okay. And they're going to be kind of droopy and sad looking. So I'm going to go for something like this. In a previous lesson, we talked about how the general shape of the eye is essentially a square, which has been pushed 
on its side a little bit. But that's just the standard eye. We could come up with so many different variations for that. We could come up with an evil looking eye. And you could argue that these are simply just expressions for the eye. But they can also pass as eye shapes, so default. Um, <clears throat> default representations of a character's eye, you know, how they look in an idle position. Okay. You could have round looking eyes. And you could have very thin, small looking eyes, something like that. So mess around with the different combinations that you can come up with for these features. You know, same with the nose. What I'll do is show you some examples of how we could mess around with the nose. We could have a long nose that is pointy. We could have an inward scoop nose. <laughs> I'm just making names for these up. That kind of bends down, it bends in along the bridge and then comes out at the bottom, kind of like a Mr. Bean nose almost. You could have a nose which is, you know, rather square looking. That would work. You know, I, you know, I know these look very cartoony and stylized, but you can render them out and they can look very, very realistic. You could have a nose that drops straight down and then the bulb kind of pokes out a little bit at the bottom. You know, good for a younger person's looking, younger person's nose. And yeah, as for mouths, let's take a look at mouths here for just a moment. So mouths, you could have, and, and again, these almost look like expressions for the mouth, but you could have a mouth that just sits there in its default position, looking a little bit like this. And you can go ahead, do some studies of all of these, practice them, see what you can come up with, get inventive. I'm just making these up as I go. There's, there's really never any right way to draw a head. There's just wrong ways to draw it. So... Um, don't be afraid to try things that are different, things that you haven't seen before. You never know what you can come up with. Okay, so again, what we can do is a long mouth. With very thin lips. Kind of like Willem, Willem Dafoe. He can do a mouth which is very small with very large lips. So, yeah, you could do a, a mouth that curls up at the ends. To be honest, there's probably not as much variation with mouths as there is with the other features. You can get some very interesting shapes with them. You can have big lip, big bottom lips. You can have big top lips and little bottom lips. And again, each one of these is going to have some level of association to it that allow us to relate with the head as being something that, you know, we're familiar with, something that we know. Again, the villain archetype, the heroic archetype, uh, and all the archetypes in between that. Right? If your character is able to be related to one of these archetypes, then all of a sudden, what ends up happening is the audience is able to understand them on some level. Right? So this guy's got very sad looking eyes, that are somewhat small. We'll give him thick eyebrows that are, you know, straight. You know, I don't want him to be an evil guy. So instead of, you know, making them 
drawing them out on an angle such as this, what I'll do is I'll have them just laying straight across the top of his brow. So that might look something like this. Again, I'm still going to capture a nice shape for them. And you can see how thick I'm attempting to make them. And again, let's have fun with this. Let's see what unique, quirky, and interesting character we can come up with. Okay, so once I've got the eyebrows roughly sketched in, I can then draw out his nose. And I think that his nose is going to be, yeah, it's going to be a long, sort of curvy nose. Something like this. I like those monkeys with the big red noses. And I'll take the nostrils up. And here we can widen the base of the nose. Usually it would sit in between the eyes and it'd only be the width of one single eye. But in this case, we're changing things up. And this is to show you that just because we've learned about the default proportions of the head, the idealized measurements, doesn't mean that we can't bend the rules a little bit in order to get some uniqueness within our characters. Those unique attributes make the character much more memorable too. They make them much more recognizable. Now, if you want to capture a, a if you want to capture consistency within your character from one panel to the next, the thing to remember is that you've got to make the changes you've made in one view to every other single view that you're going to have of them. So, in other words, if I'm drawing this guy from the side then I need to remember that his nose comes down to the point at which it lands on his face in order to capture the same length. I've got to remember the shape of the jaw and how to represent that from the side view. Okay, so try to keep that in mind. All of those different changes, the ways in which we're pushing outside the boundaries established by the idealized proportions, we need to apply those same shifts to the proportions of the head that we're drawing in all views in order to capture the consistency within it. Now, as for his mouth, uh, what I'm going to do is give him a small mouth. Okay, so I'm creating contrast within the features here. So if he's got a big nose, I'm going to give him a small face. I mean, a, sorry, a small n mouth. And I'll give him a little lip. Okay, so his mouth isn't really, you know, taking up too much space on his face. And you can see a pattern happening, you know, big eyebrows, little eyes, big nose, little mouth, big chin. Okay, that contrast really is what will capture the attention of your audience. We can suggest some anatomy here within his face. Now, I have to also ask myself, is he going to be a gaunt character? Or is he going to be, you know, a character with a little bit more, um, with a face that's more filled, filled out? And I think what I'll do is give him more of a gaunt face. You know, the shape that I've established for it kind of calls for it anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and, you know, we learned about the mouth muzzle, so we can hint toward that. I'll go up here, draw in the cheekbone a little bit. Can't wait to see your faces by the by the way. I think that'll be really interesting. And then we'll draw out the cheekbone on the other side. So the other thing I need to ask myself is, is he going to have low cheekbones or is he going to have high cheekbones? And I think every character that we draw up here will try to mix it up a little bit. If this character has fairly low cheekbones, on the next one we'll draw our character with fairly high cheekbones. Okay, wonderful. So we've got a very rough sketch drawn in for our character's face, but what about the kind of hair that we want to give them? Now here's how we go about blocking out hair. 
Okay, so what I like to try and do is I'll take large clumps of hair. Well, let me let me do some examples up over here to the side so you can see it a little bit more clearly. So what I'll typically do, say that this is the head of my character here. That's the hairline. What I'll do is I'll take larger clumps of hair and just loosely sketch out a bit of a hairstyle that I might want them to have. And as I do, I'm thinking of these larger clumps as essentially ribbons of hair, okay, that overlap one another. And you can slowly but surely capture the shape that you're looking for or the style that you want to create for the character's hairdo by doing so, by approaching it in this way. Now, once you've drawn out the general shape of the hair with these larger clumps, so you're essentially combing the style of the hair out with these larger portions, is you can start to split them up. And hair doesn't need to get complicated for comic book art. It really does not. Okay, so just start to draw them out like this. And as I lay in these additional contours, which are separating the larger clumps, you'll notice that they follow the same flow. And what I want to try to avoid is anything that looks too uniform. And in order to do that, I simply make sure that these divisions I'm making into the larger portions of hair are sitting at different distances to one another. So I'll have some that are sitting close together, some that are sitting further apart. And slowly but surely, we can start to describe the texture of the hairstyle that we've decided to go with. Now you can have lots of different hairstyles, of course. You could have, think about anime, for example, right? How often do you see an anime character that is insanely recognizable for no other reason but their hairstyle? So hairstyles can be quite incredible. Um, you know, you might have a head down here, for example, and their hairstyle might look a little bit like this, right? That's the general shape of their hairstyle. Might have another one that has a hairstyle that looks a little bit more like this. Right? Practice trying to come up with different hairstyle shapes. Another one where the hair is just flowing down by the shoulders. Could be a rock star, could be a lady. Another character where we've got long hair, but it's a little bit more messy. This one's definitely going to be a rock star. Right? And again, once you've got those general shapes established, it becomes very easy to start breaking it up and laying in, well, in this case, we're going to be actually laying in the larger clumps to the overall hairstyle first. And then simply breaking it up. As we describe the texture of the hair itself. And really, you don't have to get much more complicated than that. Yes, some people render out the hair of their characters, and that's totally fine. You can certainly do that. But it's not a complete necessity. What I'll do is I'll knock out a general shape for his hair first. This maybe. So the general shape of his hair is going to have quite a lot of width. It's going to be coming out at the sides there. And it's a bit messy. I'm, I'm breaking it up a little. You can have symmetrical hairstyles. You can have asymmetrical hairstyles. Again, it depends on the character that you're drawing. If your character's hairstyle is really messy, well, that's probably not necessarily going to suit someone who is supposed to be a clean-cut businessman, as an example. And the thing is, is that if you don't make sure that you're 
kind of lining everything up so that it makes sense, well, your, char your audience will have a disconnect with your character. They're going to feel that something is off about them, that things don't quite make sense for some reason. What I'm trying to do here is capture a little bit of symmetry. This dude looks almost like the Mad Hatter a little bit. Symmetry is quite important. Sometimes it's difficult to nail. Every artist uh, suffers from that problem. In fact, you've probably heard before that many manga artists will try to discourage their mangas from being flipped around when it comes to being printed over in the Western world because they don't want their artwork to be mirrored. And the reason for that is because once you mirror an artwork, all of the symmetrical inconsistencies become quite apparent. And so if you want to find a symmetry within your own work, then what you can do is hold it up in front of a mirror. And if you're working digitally, just flip the canvas horizontally and you'll see quite quickly where the mistakes reside within your work that are causing it to look asymmetrical, but also are just general flaws as well. Okay, so we've got his hair drawn out there. Now let's go ahead and start to refine what we have here on the page with a darker outline. Now you'll notice that I started out by drawing this in very, very lightly, this basic foundational sketch that I've whipped up here. And there's a reason for that. It's because it makes it very easy to erase. And also, once I start going over the top of it with darker lines, the lighter lines somewhat just fall back into the backdrop, and they're not as noticeable. So I'm going to go over exactly what I've laid down here, refining the finished contours, making them sharper, adding some line weights onto them. Now, the other thing about this character is that he looks like an older gentleman. Why is that? What have we included in here that causes him to appear this way? As opposed to a much younger character, you know, someone who might be in their 20s. Now, he might very well be in his 20s, but he doesn't look that way. And the reason is because, well, the larger nose for one. What happens as we get older, especially to men? Well, our noses get much longer. They get bigger, and so does our ears. Now, this guy doesn't have very big ears, but... I can tell you, if we were to give him bigger ears, he'd probably look even older. So I'm doing some cleaning up, you know, erasing a little bit around the nose here. I'm going to describe the nostril. Pull that in. And you know, just a, a little hints of detail to describe some of the key forms of anatomy within his nose. Once I've done that, I'll jump over to the opposite side of his nose and I will refine that nostril. There we go. Now let's move down to the mouth. Go ahead, lay in a darker outline for the opening. Keep it fairly thin in the middle of the mouth opening. Draw it out to the corners. And add a little bit of a, a dash there at the end. Then we'll draw in the bottom lip. I'll lay in some very subtle lines here to define the bottom lip's outline, same with the top. Although I might just leave it as is, to be honest. We can add some slight rendering around here, around the top lip. 
that's totally fine. That'll work. Just to show that it is a, of a different tone than the rest of the face. You know, lips tend to be slightly darker. They, you have darker skin on your lips. So if we can suggest that in our comic book art, it's certainly not a bad thing. Contrast is something that seems to be visually desirable within comic book art, within any sort of art. So certainly never be afraid to use it. I'm adding in a bit of rendering onto the lip there. There we go. Now he looks like he's wearing lipstick, so I might just take some of that out. All right, next up, I'm going to lay some more darker tones underneath his bottom lip. Just to describe the shape of the muscle in this area, you know, sometimes you'll get a completely black core shadow under here, so it can, it can get quite dark. And because we've got a plane that faces directly away from most lighting conditions that are projecting down onto the character from above, that's why we see such a darker tone in that area. Same with underneath the nose. If we wanted to, we could even drop a shadow which is being projected from the bottom of the nose down onto the rest of the face. I think we'll just leave that out for now though, since that's not the focus of today's demonstration. Now what I'm going to do is start to make his jawline look more defined. Going over the top of that lightly drawn, sketched in shape that I laid down for it earlier. And essentially cementing it. And I'm just going over the top of my line, making it thicker and darker to the desired degree that I'm looking for in order to capture the line quality that I think will work best for the finished illustration. Okay, so you can see the very interesting shapes we've got going on here around his chin as well. I'll do the same thing on the opposite side of his face. Pressing down harder, going back over the top of these lines as many times as I need to in order to darken them up. And making sure that the shape that they ultimately describe is one that is strong, one that's vivid. That's very, very important. Shape is everything. In fact, the silhouette really does play a huge part of your character. So this guy has a very strong silhouette thanks to his hairstyle, thanks to the shape of his face. You know, silhouette is just the outline of the shape of each part of your character. And even if you have no details within your artwork, no fancy pants shading or anything like that, that shape is going to come through and create the level of appeasement that you're looking for with from your audience. So I'm trying to describe some of the anatomy around this area of his face. And I will add in some very light rendering. Okay, so this is this is more of a style that you'd expect to see from, as an example, maybe J. Scott Campbell or Michael Turner. Um, and they typically didn't use a whole lot of rendering. Okay, they would create areas like this that suggested smaller pockets, smaller indentations within the anatomy, but uh, really didn't go ahead and, and use a whole lot of cross hatching or shadows or anything like that. Sometimes they did, yes, but uh, it wasn't a common look that you'd expect their artwork to have. So what I tend to do is I double up my lines. You can see that I've just done it right here around his jaw. You can do the same thing as well. And what it does is it just, it gives your single contours some more depth than they would have had if they were just sitting on their own. Okay, 
Great, and you can see that I'm also adding in line weights around the outer cheek there. So I'm thickening up the lines in these areas. And really, line weights, if I just do two lines like this, for example, you know, they're usually going to thicken up around the middle, like so. And also around where they meet. So there is an example. You know, if you have some muscles, you know, say that this is the, the outer contour of a very muscly arm, you're going to have a nice thick outline around the bulge. And here, you'll thicken up the outline of this muscle as it overlaps the other. And it's basically just a way of adding more interest to what would have otherwise been a very boring looking line. Okay, it's, it's all about creating a captivating experience for your audience in the end. That's why we go to the trouble of adding in all of these effects. But really, the most important part of the entire thing is that foundational loose sketch that we laid in to begin with, because you wouldn't be able to add the icing onto the cake if there was no cake. Okay, cool. So I'm getting getting my eraser out, doing some cleanup. So, and we can add a little bit of rendering around the chin here, just at the base. And you can see how very thin that is how subtle the rendering can be, and it doesn't need to get any more hardcore than that. Okay, again, some more rendering around the mouth muzzle. I'm keeping it very light, very subtle, just enough to describe the forms in that area. We've got some definition within his cheekbones on this side of the face. So we can suggest them with some more subtle lines. What I do, in fact, is just erase some of that. Okay. And then down here, around the side of the mouth, we'll also add some very subtle suggestions of form. Could even be a single line, and that'd do. It's a very different style, you know, to sometimes what I would do on, an, on the comic book I'm working on right now, uh, which is more dark fantasy. And so with Dark Fantasy comes a lot of really thick, dark shadows and lots and lots of rendering as well. So here's the thing. The style you go for and the finish on your artwork that you decide to pick is going to lend toward the genre of comic book that you're doing. You know, I think that this style would really suit a sci-fi comic book, for example, because it's extremely clean. Maybe if it's more of a, a dystopian sci-fi, you could add the shadows in there, like a sci-fi noir. But again, every genre is going to have its own look and its own feel. So depending on the genre you've decided to go with for your story, you're going to want to represent your characters within it in the right way so that it makes sense within that genre. I'm going to erase the underlying head here that we've added in. These side planes we'll get rid of. This guy's face is really starting to come together now. Let's tackle his eyes. So we'll lay in a more defined around light we'll lay in a more defined contour around the top. We'll darken them up ever so slightly. 
hinting at his eyelashes. Again, it's good to add a thicker outline around the eyes just to draw attention to them. The eyes are the windows into the soul, as they say. So the first place that people are really going to try to hone in on. That's why it's important to be able to draw eyes well because they end up being the first impression of the, the entire face. People are going to see them first. Everything else will be sort of judged against them. So get good at drawing eyes, in other words. And just going back to style, what I'd suggest you do if you're trying to develop your own one that's memorable is, yes, take into account what I've said about ensuring that they're congruent with the genre you're working in, but also on top of it, you know, find styles that you like, that other artists have come up with. And if you feel like you'd enjoy drawing in that sort of style, come up with a version of that style that is uniquely yours. You know, you can always be inspired and influenced by things. You don't want to copy a style exactly necessarily. But you can certainly you know, derive yours from it. Heck, put multiple styles into a big blender and see what comes out the other side. I think every single artist who has ever drawn has done that before. You're going ahead and placing in some eyebrow texture now, and you'll notice that it's, it's not unlike drawing in the hair. We're breaking them up into larger clumps, adding in some smaller indications of hair, and trying to get something that looks fairly textured, something that looks like it's actually made of hair. And again, one of the keys to being able to pull that off effectively is ensuring that you're able to go ahead and space those individual contours out in an organic looking way, meaning that they're not uniform, meaning that they're not evenly spaced apart. They're somewhat random, randomized. Okay, there we go. We've got his eyebrows drawn in. I'm just going around the outside of them to further define their shape. And I'll do the same thing on the opposite side here. First, defining the shape of his eye, getting that sorted, and then I'll jump back up to the eyebrow. And you'll see that I didn't necessarily start with the eyes. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. But the moral of the story is that you can really, you can tackle this from any angle you want. There's a million ways to skin a cat, right? Is that what they say? Oh, there's more than one way. <laughs> so, you know, same thing with your drawing. You can really approach it in whatever fashion feels best for you. Again, on this side, we'll do the exact same thing. We're laying in those Eyebrow, eyebrow strands drawn out. The speed at which you work, as long as you're able to capture a nice, neat-looking presentation by the end, work at whatever speed you like. I will say, though, that if you work slower, uh, it can cause you to overthink things a little bit. And ideally, the place you want to be in is working at a speed that's slightly faster than you can think, so that your natural, intuitive, artistic self can kick in and take over the situation. Because otherwise you can really uh, self-monitor a lot, and when you're self-monitoring, you're increasing your level of anxiety, you're taking attention away from the creation itself, and, and you're judging the artwork before it's even really done. 
So, you know, rather be, than being so invested in the outcome, try to sink into the process as much as you possibly can. Become a part of it and enjoy that. It's important. All right, so before we move on to the hair, what I'm going to do is just start to lay in some additional details. You can see I haven't even added in any wrinkles, but he still looks like a fairly, you know, matured looking gentleman. I'm going to add in some details around the eyes. Describing some of the forms and, and the anatomy that you'd see around this area. Adding in some slight rendering. And those render lines, you'll notice, are very, very thin. They're very, very elegant looking. They're not... You know, they're defined, but they're not taking too much attention away from the main outlines that I've drawn down there because they're simply not as thick and dark. So make sure that your render lines are never thicker and darker and never take away more attention than the outline itself. Okay, they should be very, very thin. Yes, you can still add line weight to them for sure, but make sure that that line weight doesn't exceed the thickness of the line weights around the outer contours. Okay, and now what we'll do is add in his iris and pupil. Now the positioning of the iris and pupil is pretty important. You don't want to, you know, the, uh, the top eyelid tends to rest over the top of the pupil and iris just a little bit. So what you'll find is that if you add your pupil right in the middle of the eye, they look really surprised or scared or freaked out. So uh, if you want them to look more relaxed, then move the iris and pupil up a little bit. We could add a tiny bit more rendering in around here to describe the area where the form and the uh, the form of the eye socket and the nose somewhat merge together into one surface. Something like that, maybe. And there we have it. His face is pretty much done at this point. You could call that a finished artwork, seriously. Um, you could frame it, hang it on your wall, and show it off to your, your friends, your family. Say, hey, here's what I learned in Heads and Faces workshop. I'm adding in some frown lines up the top here. You know, again, because he is somewhat of an older looking character. And, and check this out, right? I'm laying in the main outline, and then I might place in a slight render line that runs against that main outline. Okay, I could do the same thing this one as well. Again, just keeping it subtle. See, that's too much, so I'm going to get rid of it. And I could continue these lines up and around the brow, up and around the forehead. And you can see that they, they really do add some character to the head that we're drawing up here. Do the same thing on the opposite side. Cool. So I forgot to add in fold around his bottom eyelid on this side of the head, so I'll do that now. Again, just these little lines to suggest form. That's all you really need. Next up, we will tackle the hair, finally. Uh, now, hair can be, you know, it can be very long and tedious in terms of the amount of time that it takes, or it can be fairly quick. 
The one good thing that I'll say about hair, though, is that it's something that doesn't need to look any particular way. All I would say is that comb... So as I draw out these lines, check this out, right? As I draw out that line, I'm almost imagining myself as combing the hair in the direction that I want it to flow in. So what I'd say is think about it in that way yourself. Again, we've got the main clumps of hair defined. Now it's just a matter of breaking them up. We'll do the same thing over here. Again, I'm just pulling out the hair, combing it in the direction that I want it to flow in. And I'm trying to keep these lines as smooth and as free-flowing as possible. Again, hair is a very organic element that we add to the head. And by organic, I mean that it kind of, it, it follows its own path. You know, it, it never looks any one way all, all of the time. It's always blowing in the wind. It's getting messy, it's getting combed, it's getting neat and tidy, it's getting styled in different ways. It's malleable. So there's, you know, there's fairly little pressure put on oneself when it comes to actually drawing it out. People aren't going to, they're not going to necessarily be super analytical about it. Now, of course, there's some characters that have a very recognizable and uniquely established hairline, such as Goku from Dragon Ball Z, for example. And the thing about those hairstyles is that you do have to get them right, <laughs> because if you don't, people will say, hey, that's not Goku's hair. Or whatever character you've come up with, they'll say, that's not your character's hair. But even then, you know, those characters are going to find themselves in situations where the elements are at play. And that, if they're in the middle of a hurricane, you can bet that their hair is going to be blowing around in the wind. Otherwise, it'll look like it's made of some kind of, I don't know, solid plastic or something. And there's no hair gel in the world that can withstand a hurricane, so just keep that in mind. I'm slowly but surely making my way around this character's hairstyle. Breaking it up. Drawing it out clump by clump. And I challenge you to come up with lots of different hairstyles. Practice those hairstyles. Try to create something which is going to withstand the test of time. But most importantly, have fun with it as well. You know, when you have fun drawing, that's when you get the most creative. That's when you're going to find that you come up with the best ideas which is kind of annoying because you would think that you know you'd get your best ideas when you actually tried to come up with your best ideas and you put effort into coming up with your best ideas but the most annoying thing in the world is that these things happen when you're not trying at all so you know that's just the nature of creativity it likes to be free so don't put pressure on it enjoy the process, have fun, and then let the chips fall where they may. Now, that's different from practice. When you're practicing, you know, for example, the basic structure of the human head, that's a different deal. Or the anatomy of the human body, you know, you're, you're trying to accomplish something very specific there. There's not a whole lot of creativity that actually needs to go into it. So, yes, be very, very conscious of what you're doing in that instance. 
you know, what we're doing here today is actually quite creative. There's some structure involved with it for sure, but you are able to to really push outside the boundaries of the established set of rules and, and just look at how much more unique our character heads can be when we do that. Look at the level of character within this guy. He's so different. And at the same time, he's so relatable for some reason. You know, I think that more stylized looking characters that are unique um, and I guess not super realistic, they seem to connect better with the audience. And there are some theories behind why that is. And some people theorize that it's for the same reason we really connect with and relate with emoticons. You know, the more stylized something is, the more we relate to it as being us. Whereas the more realistic of a style we have and the characters that we're drawing, well, then all of a sudden it becomes someone else because in day-to-day -day life, when we're communicating with other human beings, we're looking at very detailed versions of what a human being is. You know, they're in front of us. We can see all the wrinkles on their face. We can see all of the details. But our own understanding of who we are, how we think about ourselves inside our mind, well, it's, it's much more symbolic. You know, we know where our eyes sit on our face, and we're aware of that for sure, but... So it's a, it's a very interesting thing to think about, especially when it comes to developing your own style, you know. I think that in the end, all of this comes down to storytelling, though. What kind of story are you trying to tell? You'll notice that I'm hitting the undo button there on some of these lines just because they're so long. And, you know, again, you want to keep them nice and elegant and smooth. And, uh, and you can really turn up the st stabilization on your brush in order to be able to do that. That's in the pen settings. Just over here, here, I'll show you. If you want to get nice smooth lines, just increase this stabilization here and you'll be able to draw them out with ease. On my pen tool, I think I have that turned up to about 60. So there you go. I guess that makes me a, a, a bit of a cheater when it comes to drawing smooth, elongated lines. You know, I say use the tools at your disposal. Not to the detriment of the development of your own abilities. Because I can tell you, um, you know, I can, I can draw a pretty good smooth line without the stabilization. And the way to do that manually is hold your stylus loosely. And try to... Um, Try to, to pull it out in one fell swoop, right? Draw lightly, somewhat lightly. And kind of let the line travel where it wants to travel. You know, it doesn't have to be exact. Remember, this sketch that we drew down initially, it's very loose. Okay, so we don't have to follow over the top of those loose lines 100% accurately. Final ones are going to be wherever they're going to be. But as I said, your style, it all comes down to storytelling, right? As I said before, if you're trying to tell a dark fantasy story, then the way that your characters look and how you design them, how you represent them, the level of detail that they have, how stylized they are, that's all going to change. And in a sense, that's why it's good to be somewhat diverse with your style if you want to get more commissions. You know, there's some artists who might go from working on Superman to working on My Little Pony. And the t styles between those two books are, of course, extremely different. And, you know, the guy drawing Superman can't draw My Little Pony in the way that My Little Pony is supposed to be drawn, then... He won't get the job, or she won't get the job. So yeah, try, to, try to be conscious of that stuff 
when you're thinking about how you want your art to look and the purposes that you want to use your art for. You know, if you want to just do your own thing and you're not really that interested in doing commissions, which some people truly aren't. Um, you know, for example, I like doing commissions, but I like doing my own thing a lot too. So, you know, my style is something that I'm very much putting as a priority over the styles that other people might want me to draw in. So thinking about what your goals are and then making decisions that allow you to get closer to them, and allow you to ultimately meet them one day, are probably the best route to take. Okay, so we've gone ahead and we've laid in his hairstyle. You'll notice that that took a fair amount of time. And uh, that is the truth of the matter, is that hair can take a lot of time. Now, some artists, what they'll do is they'll just blot in lots and lots of shadow and they'll be able to hide most of this detail with that shadow, render it out a little bit, and bada boom, bada bing, it's done. You know, lots of time saved. But that's not always the case, you know? Maybe you want to draw a, a character that has white hair. Well, in that case, you are going to find that you're not going to be able to put in a lot of shadow into that character's hairstyle. Now notice here around the hairline, what I'm trying to do is define its edge a little bit more by adding more hair rendering around it. The way in which I'm doing that is I'm just pulling more strands out, but I'm ending them short. And I'm sort of merging them into one another. So they essentially collide at a certain point, and that's what cuts them off. I'm going all the way up the top of the hair ribbon, as I like to call it. So in other words... You know, I might have a hair ribbon that's going all the way up here, but then the next one might end up going only up to here and colliding with another one that's sitting right next to it. So it doesn't get as far. All right, so finally what we'll do is go ahead and lay in some subtle line weights around the main clumps of hair. And this is just really to, to polish it up. Again, you really want to try to have light divisions in the hair and then darker outlines around the main sections, around those main clumps. And that just adds some dynamic visual interest and aesthetic to the finished contours, to the finished line work. Especially around the base of the hair, we want to thicken up some of those outlines to suggest that maybe there's a shadow being somewhat projected down onto the rest of the head. Thicken up this outline ever so slightly. And you can see just the contrast between the lines, it, it somewhat helps with the readability of the drawing. That's what contrast does. It leads the eye and it helps the audience to break it down visually and interpret it with ease. So when you thicken up the outline of the main areas within your drawing, what ends up happening? Well, the viewer takes in the main outline first and then they can start to explore all the little details once they've done that. Whereas if they're trying to take in the outline and all the details at once, they don't know where to begin. They don't know how to interpret what's being shown to them. It's like if someone was just, you know, um, ranting at you about crazy stuff. You wouldn't know what they were on about. So you want to try to organize 
the hierarchy of visual representation within your work using some of these tactics and techniques using things like line weight. That's going to help you out in a really big way. Okay. So we've almost finished this guy's head. Yeah, remember not to stress about your drawing. It's supposed to be a relaxing activity. But during the studying stage, yes, you know, really make every effort to pay attention to what it is you're doing. I think probably drawing idealized heads are uh, the most difficult thing to do because they do need to look a specific way. But it really depends on the kind of story you're going for. You know, a superhero story uh, is going to need more idealized looking characters, but a story which is more unique, you know, you're really only working with archetypes then, and, and archetypes such as the mad scientist, which this guy might be, uh, can be stylized in any number of different ways, be represented in a lot of different ways, as long as the main characteristics shine through. Okay, next we'll lay in the back of his neck. And you can see there that I'm just darkening up the outline that I've already laid down. Place in his trapezius muscles. Front of his neck and the other side. There we have it. I could also add in a little bit of a fold around his nostril. That'll once again increase his age a little bit. And I'll do that on both sides. And there we have it. I'd say we can call that head done. Hey, thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the tutorial and that you got a ton of value out of it. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the lesson that you've just watched is actually part of a much larger class, which you can access via the links in the description below. It's available on both howtodrawcomics.net and Skillshare, and it's going to take you through even more examples of head shape, facial feature, and hairstyle variation, step by step, the entire process from beginning to end. So if you'd like to delve deeper into this topic, then I highly suggest you check out the full class. And until next time, keep drawing.